Thanks, Tom. Once again, it's a great privilege and a great honor to be here this morning. Uh, we are about the Lord's business, the Lord's mission, and I hope today's message will uh, trigger some more hunger in our hearts about taking Jesus to our neighborhood and anywhere we are in the city. Uh, I will show you some clips about London City Mission and what we do just for the sake of those who don't know us very, very well. Uh, London City Mission is a missionary organization that exists to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the city of London. And we have close to 200 people on the field who are working for us in different parts of the city. Some are full-time missionaries, some are part-time, some are volunteers. But what brings all of us together is the idea that we want Jesus and his name to be established in the city. And so, and we understand that there are three values attached to that. One is the fact that we have to be rooted in, in the gospel. So first and for, foremost, we are a gospel devoted, rooted organization. We believe with all our heart that only Jesus can save. And that there is no other name under heaven by which anyone can be saved except through Christ alone. So we preach Christ plus nothing and minus nothing on the field. Two, we realize the place of our churches. We realize that the church is the default mission agency of God. Where you are today, you are the redemptive tool and hands of God in this part of the city. And so we like to work with churches to proclaim Jesus. Number three, the last one of our values is that we want to focus on those least rich areas of the city where life is pretty very difficult where there's so much of uh, dysfunctionality, disharmony in families, in marriages, and all sorts of things. The places that most Christians will not go to, we like to go there and tell them that Jesus loves them and that Jesus you know, has a lot of value in their lives that he went to the cross and died for them. So that's who we are. I'm going to show you this clip right now if I London the mission, and then I'll come up again. In 1835, London was a city of nearly two million people concentrated into a small area. Working class people crowded together in a maze of narrow courts and back alleys. Filth, poverty and disease were rife. Many children were brought up amidst physical and moral corruption, uneducated and uncared for. Although at the time churches on the outskirts of London were full, Hardly a third of the people in the poorer areas ever darkened the doors of a place of worship. The churches of London were aware of the problem, but they struggled to find an effective response. It was to such a scene that a young Scotsman named David Naismith came in the summer of 1835. Naismith believed that the working classes and the marginalised would best be reached by Christian workers who came from the same background understood the people's needs and could communicate with them in a relevant way. And so London City Mission was founded in Naismith's small cottage in Hoxton on the 16th of May 1835. Naismith was influenced by the urban ministry of a Scottish minister, Thomas Chalmers, who divided areas into small districts and volunteers would visit the people there. London City Mission adopted this pattern Missionaries went to the least reached, visiting people over and over again. The same person going to the same people regularly to become their friend for Jesus' sake. On the doorsteps of London's shops lie people without a place to call home. Behind the prison doors of Brixton and Pentonville sit those looking for hope. Cultural, language and religious barriers of fear isolate many in need of safety and love. The closed doors of London's tower blocks and estates hide broken people longing for answers. London needs Jesus. London City Mission exists to bring the love of God and the good news of Jesus Christ onto the doorsteps of our local areas, into the lives and hearts of those we meet.
Thank you very much for that. I've got a few more slides, just, if you can just root by that very quickly, just to show you some kind of places where we are actually working right now. Okay, shall we just put that on hold? That's, that's fine. If you have a Bible this morning, please open your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. And I'm going to read from verse 4 through to 9. Jeremiah 29. Father, I pray again that you will stop our hearts through your word and that we'll be people who love you, who love the city, who want to take your gospel to everyone around us. So challenge us, encourage us today. For we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 4. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says, the God of Israel, to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, you build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Verse 6 Marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and the diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They prophesy lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is a very profound passage of the scriptures. Just imagine that you have left your home country, not by your choice. A lot of people live in London here, not because of economic reasons. Some are here because of some troubles in their home countries. So they have arrived in London against their own choices in life. If they had a choice today, they would like to go back to their home countries. And if you are that kind of person, your default mindset is anger, bitterness. Look at what my country has done to me. I wish I could go back tonight and do something else with my life in my home country. But what we don't understand most times is this. That any kind of movement in life, underneath any kind of migration or movement in life is the sovereignty of God. So no matter how you came to the UK, if you are non-white British, or even if you are, the fact that you are born in this country, everything about your life is tied down to one thing, the sovereign hand of God. You would never have been here today if God did not permit it to happen. And that's the story of Israel. They've gone into exile. And what you do in exile is complain. Look at us in slavery. What are, we, what are we doing here? Why is God angry with us? Well, look at what God says to his people and to us. He says, build houses there. Yes, I'm the one punishing you. I'm the one <laughs> giving you this hardship. But underneath all of this is my sovereign hand, and I still, I still have a plan for you. Settle in the city of Babylon. Build houses. 
You don't want to build a house in a place where you don't want to stay, especially if you are there in exile. But because God wants to use his people as his agents of redemption in Babylon, he allowed it. And he says, you marry, give your daughters in marriage, and continue to multiply and prosper in this land. The point I'm trying to make from this portion of scripture is this, that God loves the city. In as much as our cities at difficult places, full of hardship, economic hardship, social hardships, all sorts of crime going on. Amidst all the economic advantages of high-powered jobs and big connections in the city for those who are high flyers, we know that there's a lot of evil going on in the city. But what we don't see all the time is the fact that God loves the city. That in the midst of all of this darkness, he's at work in our cities. He's moving by his spirit in our cities. And the agent of this redemption to the city are his people. Yourself and myself. So we know that there are at least 119 cities mentioned in the Bible, at least about 1,200 references to cities in the Bible. God in scriptures has been using cities as his conduit of, re of redemption. And what he does is to place his people in the city for that purpose. We know that in less than probably 25 years from now, or 30 years from now, at least 60% of people all over the world will live in the cities. In Africa, where I come from, less than 10 years from today, at least 40% of Africans will be in the cities, if no more. God has planned for the cities. And that's why he put us here for that purpose. We're not here just to chase money and fame and all sorts of things. We're here because there's a divine agenda. There is a redemptive agenda of God for our city. So, what did God say to them? Verse 7. He says, seek the peace of the city. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city. Because if it prospers, you too, you will prosper. This is my point this morning, or my first point really. The much of peace and shalom that we extend to our city is the degree to which ourselves we have prosperity and peace. If we ignore, if, you, if we fail to take Jesus to our cities and we allow evil and crime to persist amongst us, we also will not have peace and prosperity. The starting point of God's people is to have a rethink that we're here because God wants to do something through us. He wants to use us as his agents, as his instruments of redemption to the city. But the principle is very clear. If we establish or we take the shalom, the peace of God to our cities, we ourselves will be at peace. One of our missionaries almost lost his son some years ago in East London. His, child, his son was part of some group of boys in the neighborhood. I know when these young boys start stabbing themselves all over the place, they, saw, they, went, they, 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 they mistook him. It was a, a case of mistaken identity. They went to his house and stabbed him almost to death. Stabbed him even in the neck. A missionary who was supposed to be preaching peace had his son attacked on account of mistaken identity. Now, many of these young boys many years ago, we've, we've done some research into their background. They grew up from the church. They were in the churches all around. Somehow, our churches failed to disciple them properly. They went astray. They are now on the streets. 
Many of them are sons and daughters of preachers in the city. Now they are not only troubling the city, they are troubling us as well. Do you get the point? I used to travel a lot on my previous job. And sometimes you get to the airport. I used to do about 15 or 18 countries in a year. You get to the airport, you are looking at who's next to you in the flight. You are not sure who is Taliban, who is, who is a, a terrorist. Everybody is looking with suspicion. I've been to places where I was the only black person on the flight. And I could see how my, the people next to me were very suspicious of who is this guy. Why? Because when there's no peace in the land, God's people cannot enjoy peace as well. Because we have the peace and we ought to take it to them. The more we reach out to the city with the gospel, it's not just to save them or establish that peace, it's also for us to enjoy the peace in the city. That's why we have to take our task very seriously. My son was with me in the office some months back. And right there behind my office, there was a knife crime during the day. Right there. And the police came, tried to address the situation. My son was crying in the office. He said, Daddy, I don't want to leave this building anymore. I don't want to go home today. He was afraid. The point is this. If we step out of our building regularly to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to those boys and girls hanging around, hanging around our office, as we take peace to them, we also are going to have peace in our neighborhood. If we ignore them and don't take Christ to them, we also suffer. We're a community of peace. And God wants to use us to extend this peace to our cities, to our neighborhood. Your friend who is wounded, who is, whose life is, is battered with pain and frustration, you are the instrument of peace to that your friend, your family, your loved, your loved ones, your colleagues. Number two point here. If we really have to be a community of peace, that can take peace to the city or to our neighbors, that demands the second point I want to make this morning. You need to understand your city and your neighborhood. Every people group, every person we meet in life, every kind of uh, religious group in life has an ongoing narrative that defines who they are. So we know that the first point is to know our Bible very well and to know the gospel, that's fine. The next point, if we want to be a community that can take peace to other communities, we need to understand who they are. When people come to church here on a Sunday morning, be quick to greet them and be quick to find out who they are, where are they coming from, what defines their journey so far. Because it quickly helps you to know how to begin to establish or connect them with this peace of God. Poverty is not just a case of I don't have money. People are not poor just because their, their pockets are empty. Holistic poverty is defined as having broken relationships all over. First relationship with God if, if, if one does not have a relationship with God of the universe through the Lord Jesus Christ, we're spiritually destitute and poor. That's where the Bible defines us. But we thank God for Jesus Christ who, who came, went to the cross. Our sins were laid upon him. He died for every one of us. And by putting our, our faith and trust in him, we are not just saved to go to heaven, we're actually we are restored back to the dignity of humanity. You become, in God's family, somebody that God, you know God values you. You have, you have a place in God's community. When Jesus heals people in the Bible, it's not just to make their bodies well. It's the fact that he wants to restore their dignity back to the community. You get my point? 
So, when people, when people come around you who you don't know too well, understand that they have an existing journey that defines their identity. And it, def it is also defines how they function in life. When you have th these two components in place, you know exactly how to access them with the gospel of peace. That's why it takes a lot of listening and humility to impact your communities for Jesus. I tell you this. There are some, I've been, I was a pastor before I moved on into missionary work. Some of us come from cultures where when you are in a Bible study, we don't speak too much, not because we're ignorant, but because the cultures where we come from, you are not allowed to speak unless the leader says speak. You get the point? So when you are in that kind of Bible study and some people are quiet, don't think they're ignorant. You need to understand that they don't speak unless you say speak. Unlike Western culture where everybody is ranting in Bible study. <laughs> Just saying it all the time. Yes, I feel like I feel I feel this way. <laughs> that you think, oh, those guys are a bunch of ignorant guys. They're not ignorant. You don't understand where they're coming from. When you get to understand them, you say, could you please speak? That you hear wisdom from his mouth. Some Americans invited some Mexican women for, for Christmas party. It was a very middle class church in America. And most of the wives were not working, they were home. The husbands could look after them. So they wanted, they wanted to host a party for the Mexican women in their neighborhood. A Christmas party, very nice kind of thing to do. And they sent out flyers into the neighborhood and put the time there, 12 noon, 12 noon. And the day of the party, they didn't see any Mexican woman, not even one showed up in the afternoon. And they went around, why? You know us, we know you, why didn't you show up for our party? They said to them, you know, we Mexican women, we work during the day. If you want us to come for a party in church, we can only come in the evening as from 7 p.m. And they asked them, if we change the date to se the time to 7 p.m., will you come back again? They said yes. They went back again and, and put a flyer in through their doors and said, come for Christmas dinner, 7 p.m. The whole hall was packed full of Mexican women. You need to understand the people that you are called to serve. Knowing your Bible is important, it's foundational. The next stage of, of being a, a community of shalom to others is to understand their narrative and their journey so far. That gives you the wisdom to access their lives with peace. A lady told me how her mom has widowed two men. She herself has widowed one. I knew her story where to say, how do I connect her to the source of liberty and deliverance? Are you following what I'm saying this morning? Everyone that comes into this place or in our neighborhood, they have a narrative that defines their identity and that defines their journey. Do a lot of listening. After a while, through the help of the Holy Spirit, you will find a connecting point that you can access them and establish them and call them into the shalom peace that Christ has given to us. But first, we must practice that in the household of God. Before we can be the people of peace to our neighborhood, we must establish a community of peace in the household of God. And I will encourage you this morning, dear friends, be that kind of community. When people walk into this place, don't wait for the leaders alone. Reach out to them. Invite them to your home. Listen to them. Listen to them. As you listen and they tell you more about their journey in life, you will know how to pray for them. And if you're here this morning, I'm here for the first time, you're here for the first time, you are very much welcome to the household of God. Jesus loves you, died for you, and that's why you're here this morning. It's not an accident of history. 
And I want to encourage every one of you. Reach out to everyone. Where you work, where you live. Keep reaching out to them. But understand the fact that people have a journey so far in their lives that you can't erase from them. Don't attempt to disciple them to be like you. Make them to disciple them to be like Christ. I love what I see here this morning. A church of all nations. This is a gospel church. A church that truly represents the sign of the kingdom. This is what a, a, a community of peace looks like. Where everyone is welcome. And I want to encourage you this morning. Keep at it. It's not the easiest journey to, to go through. Be persistent. Because that's kingdom vision. Thank you for inviting me this morning. I call on Tom.